everyone. Welcome to this webinar on uh, the fallouts of the sewer situation. Uh, my name is Andrew Schultz. I'm the Global Head of Ocean Freight here at Flexport, and I'm super excited to spend the next full hour with, uh, with all of you. Before we get into, uh, into the details, uh, just a big fat disclaimer right here. The situation is very, very uh, fluid. It's literally evolving by the hour. So everything we say today may change tomorrow. So just keep that in mind as we share uh, information with you uh, throughout this uh, this webinar. Um, I'm super excited to uh, introduce you the, 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 the co-speakers today. I have with me uh, Trina Nilsson, who runs uh, Flexport Ocean Freight in the EMEA region. We have uh, Nathan Strang, Director of Ocean Freight in North America. And then finally, uh, Lars Jensen, uh, CEO and partner as, uh, at the Vespucci uh, Maritime. So Trina and Lars, it's, uh, it's only a month ago the three of us met to talk about uh, the 2024 uh, situation, what to expect in the world of ocean freight. And I think, you know, consensus between all of us was that uh, it would be somewhat uh, smooth sailing unless unless we had another Black Swan event, which we're seeing right here in front of us. Uh, we talked about uh, the war situation in Gaza and everything going on there. But it's very clear that, you know, the situation has escalated and we are now in a situation where carriers have had to either pause or reroute vessels uh, south of Africa. Uh, so uh, let's dive in, peel the onion, and talk about what's happening right here, right now, and what to expect the coming uh, weeks and months. Um, just a practical note uh, for everyone dialing in here, if it's the first time you are joining a Flexport webinar, um, you can uh, find a few features in the app right here. You can download the slide deck um, uh, in case you like some of the information here. Feel free also to follow up with anyone from Flexport if you want more information. You can also ask any questions uh, in app. We have a few Flexport representatives uh, at, your, uh, at your fingertips who can essentially uh, come back with, uh, with answers. We're going to do a general uh, Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So uh, as you go through and if you have questions, just uh, type them in the app. Um, but yeah, let's dive in. So um, Friday morning, uh, we saw... Um, the first uh, uh, essentially escalations in, uh, in the situation right here. We saw that Maersk, uh, the world's second largest uh, container uh, carrier, essentially announcing that they were pausing uh, sailings. And they have uh, since then um, decided to divert, divert a lot of their sailings south of uh, Africa. Same goes for any uh, other major uh, container there. They have all decided by now to pause or divert uh, their sailings. We still have a few niche carriers uh, out there that uh, are passing through the Suez Canal. But other than that, we're close to essentially 100% of capacity, either pausing you know, in the Red Sea, in the Gulf of Aden area, or diverting um, south of, uh, south of uh, the Cape of Good Hope. So this is uh, coinciding with the Panama situation uh, that we have been, been following the past month, uh, the biggest uh, drought, in history, uh, drought in history in the Panama Canal. So essentially, we now have two massive uh, disruptions in the two uh, biggest canals uh, in, the, in the world of shipping. So it's probably uh, somewhat overwhelming for all of you out there, uh, essentially trying to follow uh, what's going on in the news, keeping up with uh, all the changes and all the latest announcements. So we have tried right here to dumb down the situation with some of the key milestones we've been following the past uh, the past month or so. So Lars, over to you, help us understand what's going on here and what the key highlights uh, of this, uh, this situation. If we start over in the Panama Canal, as you put it, there's just not enough water there. That caused the canal to reduce the number of transits you can do per day. The carriers responded logically by the only thing they could do. They told some of their customers, Asia to US East Coast, look what, we have to go through Suez. It's a longer trip. It takes you a week, week and a half longer. It can be done. So they actually diverted quite a few services to go through the Suez Canal. Fantastic solution until the debacle that we're in now. That all of a sudden mean that those services cannot go through Suez either. They have to go all the way around the Cape of Good Hope, delaying everything by up to yet another week. Then you have on the Suez Canal itself. The issue is once the attack started, then the trigger point was on Friday with a vessel being hit by a drone. It doesn't sound like much. How can such a giant vessel be brought down by a single drone? That's not the issue. 
The issue is once you have a fire in containers on a mega vessel, it doesn't take much for that fire to spread and destroy the entire vessel. We saw that with most Conan, for example, five years ago. So the decision made on Friday by the shipping lines is absolutely prudent, given the risk. But that then sets in, in, in motion a chain event here because the vessels that, not the ones that are going to Europe, they're going to be late by a week or two. But the real key here are the vessels once they get back to Asia. The vessels that got stuck north of the canal also go around Africa. They will now be arriving at least a couple of weeks late out in Asia. These vessels were originally supposed to be out in Asia sometime during, say, the middle of January in time for the usual seasonal pickup to Chinese New Year. These vessels are now not going to be there. And it's going to be the same story for the vessels that originally were supposed to go to Panama, then through Suez, now going around the Cape of Good Hope. So the unfortunate timing on this is we're actually going to see a shortfall in vessels arriving in Asia just as the volume seasonally pick up in line for Chinese New Year, which falls on February 10th next year. Exactly. So, um, yeah, a few highlights based on what you said right there, uh, Lars. This is, uh, you know, a necessity essentially to keep the crew safe. Uh, it's irresponsible to continue uh, through the Suez Canal uh, until the situation uh, resolves and uh, is, it, it get, get better and safe. And then, as you mentioned last right here, the, uh, this coincides with the, the, the Lunar New Year peak, um, which essentially will mean that we are going to see, you know, a much, much tighter supply and demand balance than what we've seen essentially the past month and the past uh, year as a whole. Um, let's take a look at the, the, the map right here and the hotspots that, that Lars is talking about right here. And just to put things into perspective, right, because what, what's the math? What are the key numbers here, right? Uh, essentially, the Panama Canal takes care of, give or take, 8% of uh, global containerized freight if you exclude the intra-Asia trades, which are more short haul uh, in the Asia region. Suez, uh, on the other hand, is a much bigger deal because that essentially accounts for 30% of uh, global containerized freight, which is a very, very big deal. Uh, we saw it, you know, a few years ago uh, when the ever given vessel got stuck there, uh, how big of a deal that was. Uh, having said that, it also came on top of an already uh, tight supply and demand balance, which is a different situation that this time around where the supply and demand balance is, uh, is, is wider. We'll get into some of those details later. Nevertheless, um, these uh, two canals are very important for global trade. So when you see disruptions there, uh, it's going to have big impact. Now, last for a second, let's zoom in also on the Cape of Good Hope, which is essentially the biggest alternative route right here. Uh, is that just uh, straightforward or what should watch out for uh, around the, the Cape of Good Hope right here? The issue is you are getting into a relatively rough stretch of water down there. So whilst it's easy to sit on a spreadsheet and say, fine, it is just a few thousand extra nautical miles, we can just sail a little bit faster, it is not smooth sailing when you go south of Africa. So yes, you can sail faster, but you should also expect weather-related delays once you cross that body of water down there. It's not smooth sailing. Thanks, Lars. Let's zoom in on uh, on the world map right here and, and the overall sort of high level situation. Nathan, help us sort of unpack all the dots here and what we're seeing right here and some of the research you've been doing in the Flexport app and whatnot. Yeah, so what we have represented right here are all the vessels, uh, container ships in the world. So those are the black dots. That you um, then we took a look at all of the vessels that have diverted off of their standard east-west routing uh, that would normally take them through Suez. And that by the by the orange dot. So to date, 136 vessels are in active divert. So they have uh, committed to going southbound and sailing around Cape of Good Hope. There's another 42 that have paused this journey. So they are waiting on further orders or possibly for a situation to resolve. Some of those are in the Red Sea and uh, are not sure uh, at this time which way they're going to go, if they're going to back check through Suez or, or remain in the Red Sea and, and kind of wait things out. Um, but it's a pretty large number, but this doesn't even uh, represent even the total number of vessels that, you know, would be eligible based on on where they are in the world right now. Uh, this is only about half of the vessels that represent these services and strings. Do, do, do you have any sense of, I mean, clearly some of these vessels, let's say I'm moving right now from Shanghai down to Yanchen, then I clearly wouldn't have diverted just yet. If you take this as a percentage out of the vessels, that realistically could have had their vessels diverted. How big a share are we talking about? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a little less than half. So there's about 540 vessels that are assigned to these services. So if 136 have, have diverted already, 42 are, are kind of paused. And, and as you said, Lars, the, the rest are on their journey. So they're, they're already returned. They've already cleared Suez. Um, they're in Asia getting ready to load. They're in U.S. Uh, or European ports uh, discharging and getting ready to return. So uh, it's, it, it can add up to a much larger number of, of actually impacted services. Great insult. Thanks, Nathan. Let's try and sort of double click this map and zoom in on some of the populist, uh, of the biggest uh, of the biggest disruptions right here. Uh, Trina, over to you. Uh, if we start, you know, zooming in on the main and uh, give us some of the highlights right here. Yeah, so uh, obviously uh, going uh, to the Suez, uh, typically you would go through the Mediterranean, uh, whether your cargo is originated uh, originating in the Mediterranean or in North Europe and um, what we're seeing here and what we've tried to highlight here is that for these ships you can say if you're sailing out of Rotterdam uh, in in North Europe and you go south of the of the Cape that's one thing but if you have cargo coming out of Rotterdam that was about to pass through the Suez it adds uh, significantly more time to uh, to the transit time uh, that we're seeing. So uh, we have a few maps uh, on the next slide where we talk about general transit time expectations, um, but we also wanted to highlight that if you are, or if the vessel is currently in MED, we do expect uh, up to 16 days of delay going to India and 13 days uh, into uh, to China. So it's quite a significant additional uh, lead time uh, on this. What about um, the the East Coast uh, over in uh, North America, Nathan? Yeah, looking at the uh, the map there, there's a couple of interesting examples of things when you when you kind of like you said double click in is vessels that had originally diverted away from Panama, which are now diverting around Cape of Good Hope. So if you look um, there, you know one example Zim Coral, that's the Zim ZXB service. That that ship's next port of call is Kingston, Jamaica. Normally it would be sailing uh, eastbound, going through the Panama Canal and then north from there. Uh, they made a decision earlier because of the water levels that that we mentioned to head through Suez and now that routing is not available to them anymore and they're going to go through Cape of Good Hope. So that's going to add uh, significantly more time to that sailing um, and the cargo on board. And, and that's just one example. So uh, seeing seeing things like that and, and those unplanned and, and unforeseen circumstances are definitely going to add time to, to these shipments that are already on the water. Yeah. It's very clear that the shipments on the water are going to face, you know, the long the transit times because of all the rerouting, as we're hearing right here from both Trina and Nathan. Um, next, we've tried to zoom in on, okay, any new departures, so any new shipments that's originating from Asia or anywhere else, what are the expected transit time for those? Because that's also significant delays, uh, delays even less so than the shipments currently on the water. So, Trina, help us understand the, the picture for uh, Asia to North Europe and Asia to Mediterranean, some of the the biggest lanes out there, what's the impact? So overall, if we look aside from the short-term impact just discussed, we do expect that if uh, if you have goods going out of uh, North Europe, uh, it will result in eight to ten days longer uh, transit times uh, uh, on average. And if you are in the Mediterranean, it's uh, between 11 and 13 days. Obviously, the closer you are to the Suez, uh, on the Mediterranean, the longer the transit time uh, addition uh, will be. So that's important uh, to keep in mind. And I think, you know, we talk about the, the sort of short term impact. OK, we need to figure out what will happen on all the shipments that uh, that are moving right now. But overall, um, there's also impact to shippers. Um, there will be this sort of lead time increase that needs to be considered overall, also for longer term planning. We're not sure about when the situation will uh, will solve itself. So uh, so overall, heads up uh, to, to look at planning. Uh, also, because one of the things we've been asking customers about uh, throughout 2023 is, uh, is the inventory levels. And uh, as these have normalized uh, during the year, 
obviously the safety stock levels will will not necessarily have enough buffer to actually uh, to take this additional lead time into consideration. Uh, so the potential of stock outs is uh, obviously one thing that we uh, encourage everyone to uh, to look at, uh, because uh, the cost of that might be higher than uh, than an expedited service. Um, and then, of course, you know, just overall the additional cost of this, and you see it pretty clearly on the map. Obviously, there's a cost uh, uh, coming from uh, going through the Suez, uh, but there's also a very large bunker cost uh, for sailing south of uh, of Africa. So we do expect uh, that the cost will go up, and I think it's really important that uh, anyone shipping on these routes uh, start considering that for budgeting uh, purposes. Um, and I think, you know, just hearing from what we hear from customers uh, here in Europe, at least, we are seeing slight softening demands uh, out there for many companies. Uh, so I think this cost addition is just very important to keep in mind because I know a lot of companies uh, are... You know, it's not the easiest times to be in business these days. Um, and then, uh, you know, here in Europe uh, and uh, in the US as well, we're getting very close to Christmas. I know that there's a lot of companies out there who are eagerly waiting for the Christmas break. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you can expect a little bit of chaos. Uh, this part of planning into the new year is, of course, a large part of it, um, but even more towards the the short-term impact of all the shipments on the vessels. Great intel, uh, Trina. Talking about planning, I mean, Lars, help us understand if you're an ocean carrier and you're essentially having a stream going uh, from Asia to Mediterranean, all of a sudden you would have to essentially turn everything upside down in terms yeah. of war calls and whatnot. What, what are they doing at the moment and how do they essentially navigate this P uh, this puzzle piece here? Yeah. I I, I think right now you're, you're pointing at the right part. The, the point in the world where you get the largest problems will be in the Mediterranean in the Red Sea. Because as a carrier, it's fairly straightforward. I find I'm going to sail from, say, Shanghai up to Rotterdam and back on that service. My challenge with the Mediterranean is part of the carriers, they used to serve the Mediterranean ports on the Asian North Europe strings. And that is not going to happen right now. I'm not going to take a ship, go from Shanghai, then to Genoa, and then back up to Rotterdam. That is not going to happen. So you're go you should expect much larger disruptions to your flow into the Mediterranean ports than to the North European ports. On top of that, you also already now begin to see an impact on services purely within Europe, because some of the capacity moving cargo from Med to North Europe and vice versa was done on these Asia Europe services, which will no longer be doing exactly that. So there will be a capacity shortage on the big ships. Rest assured, you will have some of the smaller carriers pick up the slack and put in services, but it's unpredictable right now where they will go. Adding insult to injury, I mean, we're looking here at what's the added transit time on the ships. What I think a lot of customers have to realize is this could actually be more, not because of the ship, but because you might end up in a transshipment port for a lot longer than you anticipated. If you're going, and let's take a case, you want to go to a port in Italy where usually you got transshipped in, for example, Genoa. You might actually not get transshipped in Genoa. You might get the, uh, bumped off in, say, 10 years or in LC zeros because that fits, but it might not fit with your usual transshipment flow. So on top of these delays we're seeing from the ships, a lot of shippers need to brace themselves that there might be added delays for up to a week in unfamiliar uh, transshipment hubs. Which ports would you expect the biggest uh, uh, bottlenecks for last, uh, if you were to sort of like stack rank uh, and, and highlight some yeah, of them? For, 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 from, a, from a starting perspective, I would expect to see massive pressures in Al Jazeera's and in Tangiers, but I would also expect to see massive pressure on Singapore and Tanjung Pilipas and Port Klang. Because as all the networks, and really are all the networks change at the same time, coming out of Asia, I would make sure and say, fine, if I had to reassess and readjust, those are the three ports I would do it in just before leaving Asia. And especially for the Mediterranean, I would take a close look at how many ships do I need to put all the way into the Med to come out, and how much can I do just with transshipment in Al Jazeera and in Tangiers. So there will be a massive pressure on those ports in particular. Definitely. Thanks, Lars. 
Okay, let's zoom in on a different geography right here, um, uh, North America, and what routing options uh, are available right here. It's uh, it is not uh, as simple, so we try to dumb it down with uh, some color coding right here. You can see the arrows matching the table on the right in terms of what it means. But but Nathan, uh, even with the color coding, help us uh, dumb down what we see here and what uh, what options are available shipping into the East Coast and Gulf. Yeah, shipping into the East Coast uh, in Gulf. Normally, if you were moving out of North uh, North or East China, out of Shanghai, uh, you would definitely be moving via the Panama Canal. And and that routing, um, despite everything we talked about, that is still available. There are still vessels that are moving that way. It's just at a, at a far reduced capacity. Um, and so, with Panama Canal surcharges coming into effect and and other capacity restrictions with around weights of cargo, uh, it may not be available to all shippers, or or maybe at a price point that that is not attractive. Um, so normally you would have an option of going through Suez and as we discussed, that is not an option anymore. So that would normally have added about five days to your transit time. So nothing too, too, uh, too extreme, but now we're talking about going via Cape of Good Hope. So now you're talking, you know, what was a 35 day transit is now up to a 45 day transit could be longer. Um, the other thing to look at, and, and we've kind of mentioned this directly, indirectly, is that you also have to look at when the vessel's available versus your cargo ready date. Uh, these vessels also have to come back and they're coming back a long way. So you're going to see gaps in schedules. Um, you're going to see a, a little imbalance of when vessels arrive. So that normal, reliable weekly service that you're on, uh, maybe biweekly, it may be once every 10 days, uh, it may bunch and you may see a couple vessels come at once. So it's really important to start planning your cargo out further in advance and figure out which way you want to go. If you are interested in, in faster options, uh, the U.S. West Coast uh, plus rail or U.S. West Coast plus trucking are available. Um, those services uh, exist in the market already. Uh, very reliable services. We're seeing very good um, standard service and expedited service moving into the, to the East Coast of the United States on those. So that's another option that you have as well. So uh, a few more options over what we're seeing in Europe. Uh, in capacity is at a place where um, a, a lot of this can move along these routings, but it's really important to just kind of look at, you know, Trina mentioned, you know, stock, when do you, when do you expect stock um, to hit critical levels? When can you, you know, how can you manage your purchase orders with your suppliers and, and move stock either forward um, or maybe onto a different service? Uh, looking at some of those things are really important. The other thing to look at as well is we, we talked really about, you know, stuff moving out of Shanghai, but also look at what your origins are. If you're moving out of the west coast of, of India or out of Pakistan, Cape of Good Hope is probably still going to remain a, a good option for you. Uh, whereas, you know, moving out of, of Busan and Korea, things like that, you know, looking at the west coast of the United States and then the land bridge is probably more along the lines of where you should be thinking. So, Nathan, if, if I'm a shipper if i'm an importer you know from china into you know the east coast of gulf what, what do i do do i just you know press book and hope for the best in terms of transit time and price and you know rely on someone else to fix it for me or what, what do i do sort of like tangible in terms of you know right here right now yeah well i i think it's this is this is an interesting question because it's all depend on you know kind of where you are in your in your planning timeline if you have so right now if you, if you have a, a, a shipping order and and you have a booking uh, we generally recommend staying on that booking. Um, you have something reliable, you have something in hand, but generally the schedule is also known. So if you have an SO released, you know the vessel you're going to move on and you know where you're going to go. So um, just kind of accept that one. For further out planning, when you're looking at things moving in, say, January, then, then yeah, talk to your logistics professional, talk to Flexport. Like, let's figure out the best solution that balances price and speed. And there's going to be different things that you're going to look at there. Um, different options um, in every direction. And we're going to try and fit that best to what your planning factor is. I wouldn't just kind of, you know, pull the, the arm on the slot machine and kind of see what comes up. I would definitely be, you know, actively talking with your logistics team uh, and, and your Flexport team about how you would want to route the cargo. So you have a very good understanding of, of the times and of the, of course, the price that's going through. Um, I think another thing to emphasize here is, and, and uh, is that this is dynamic, and these are planning factors. So when we say you know forty four days, that's a planning factor. It's not necessarily um, exactly how long it's going to take. So it's going to take a little bit of time for us to kind of see how these services actually even out and what the real transit times are. But starting with a planning factor is important. And if already you're at the edge of your planning factor, um, then you really need to start looking at those faster solutions. Thanks, Nathan. So. 
if we zoom in on the first one uh, you, you, you outlined, right, uh, shipping via the West Coast and then railing it uh, across the country, um, it's the fastest. Um, it's obviously, you know, subject to, to, to the price, whether, you know, importers and shippers pick that option, right? But if we just, you know, look ahead, you know, a few weeks from now, last, um, do you expect, you know, as a result of potentially, you know, more shippers, more importers picking this option, um, well knowing that already 70% of the goods into the U.S. Um, from Asia is, is via the West Coast already. Do you expect, you know, congestions, bottlenecks on the inland network, both with uh, truckers and rail, rail providers uh, to uh, occur? In, in short, yes. Of course, everybody on the East Coast is not going to swing over to the West Coast, but I would expect to see a slight shift. I would expect to see increased risk of congestion both in the ports on the U.S. West Coast, but most certainly in terms of access to rail capacity to get it across the country. So so everybody on the West Coast should start to prepare for that already. And, and maybe if I may add another thing, for anybody shipping to or from South America looking at this map, you might think this has nothing to do with me. Then you have to think again. Let's pick two very, very simple examples. Let's say you are moving bananas from Chile to New York, or let's say you are moving Californian wine down to Brazil. That goes through the Panama Canal. Up until last week, that's not really an issue because a lot of the consumer goods were shifting to the Suez Canal. But now you have the situation where there's going to be a pressure on the price to pay to go through the Panama Canal. Think back two years. At the height of the disruption, what was the cargo type and the customers willing to pay the most? Those were the fast-moving consumer goods going into the U.S., those were typically the ones that were willing to pay fifteen, twenty thousand dollars per forty footer at its worst. So when it comes to a price war, who is willing to pay the most to go through the Panama Canal? Imports and exports in Latin America are likely going to be priced out of the market by some of the fast consumer goods. So if you're moving in and out of South America on trades that cross the Panama Canal, you need to also start thinking of making contingency plans. Makes sense. Just back to the West Coast for, for a second, Lars. Do you think, you know, how bad can it get, right? I mean, are we talking about, you know, getting back into a COVID uh, situation with, you know, plus 100 vessels waiting outside uh, the port of LA and whatnot? Or how do you see it? Uh, in, in the short term, I would tend to say absolutely not. But the reason I'm slightly hesitant is if, and that is an if, let's say you get a very strong uh, peak season prior to Chinese New Year, of goods into the US. I don't think there's signs it's gonna be very strong, but if you get that, then I would not rule out you're gonna see the queues outside of LA LB again. And I would be particularly concerned about rail capacity out of the Pacific Northwest. What do you think, Nathan? Yeah, I would agree with that. It's it's of course it's always about about the demand and, and approaching Chinese New Year. I think another thing that we need to look at now is it is winter. Um, not just the Pacific Northwest, but the Canadian Northwest is a very popular gateway into the United States. If we start to see low temperatures, snow, ice, um, that could slow things down as the Canadian railroads move into their winter sailing programs. So, um, yeah, rail is rail can face congestions as well. Uh, I, I think it's another thing to look at is transloading. Um, a lot of times, depending on the commodity mix, weight of cargo, things like that, you can take three 40-foot containers and fit them into two 53-foot dry vans. Uh, gain a little bit of, of uh, scale there and, and efficiency in moving cargo. And, and all those are things that options that should be discussed when, when thinking about moving through uh, an alternate gateway. Great. Thanks. So I think in sum, I mean, we definitely expect uh, the supply demand balance to be tight here, especially during the, the, the Lunar New Year peak. Uh, the million dollar question is, what is the demand going to look like uh, post, uh, post the peak? All right, let's uh, let's keep going. So uh, we have some knowns and uh, and unknowns uh, right here. Uh, Trina, help us, uh, you know, understand some of the, the the key highlights we're seeing here. Yeah. So it, as you said at the beginning, uh, we uh, continue to get uh, notifications and updates of uh, of information uh, continuously. So. We thought it would be a good thing to just highlight, okay, what do we actually know and what is it that we still need answers for? Uh, not because we don't know here in Flexport, but because there's simply no uh, decisions or, or no insight on this in general. And um, so we also know that carriers now 
more or less all of them have decided to not sail through the Suez. Uh, we also know that majority of them have decided to uh, south of uh, Cape Good Hope. And we also know that a few carriers have stopped accepting bookings um, to, uh, to Israel, um, which, you know, there's a lot of, uh, of, uh, of topics uh, in this West topic. Uh, and obviously, uh, this is uh, probably a more political one. Um, but, but we do know that that's also happening. We know that uh, some carriers have announced that uh, have already announced the force majeure. Uh, others have not. Uh, and then we know that there has been a wealth of uh, of information around surcharges uh, of uh, different sorts uh, and rate increases already being announced, uh, but also changes to terms and conditions like uh, free time. So, uh, so. There's a lot of detail in this, um, and I think one of the things that we try to do is uh, digest all of this detail and then come with the, with the slightly more clear answers. Um, and you can say at the moment what we're working very hard on in our teams is to make sure that we give clear information, that we're transparent about uh, everything we know and how the carriers are moving. To be honest, uh, we don't really, of course, we've seen situations in the market before where there's been drastic changes. Um, but this situation, once again, is a new situation. Uh, so we're just trying to uh, to keep it as transparent as possible, but also to simplify a little bit the, the, the wealth of information that is floating around at the moment. So at the moment, what we're still waiting to get clarification on is, will we see more force majeure declarations? Force majeure is really a way that uh, carriers can can say, listen, this additional cost, we just pass it through. It eliminates a lot of, uh, of general rules that we have in place uh, in general. So obviously we are, are, are watching out for that. Um, the Panama Canal, I did hear that we're happy that a bit more rain came uh, in the Panama Canal recently or in that area. Um, so uh, we, of course, you know, some people try to predict the weather. We try to refrain from that. Um, but uh, we are watching the weather forecasts very closely there. I think one of the biggest sort of unknowns to me that uh, that I think our team will look the most at is this whole equipment imbalance uh, situation. Because one thing is, uh, you know, the number of ships sailing out, that's pretty transparent. Uh, and one thing is getting your container on a ship. But if you don't have access to the container, it doesn't matter that the ship sail. Um, and I think... Personally, I think there'll be a lot of spillover effects potentially of uh, of this situation, especially when it comes to the equipment positioning. Um, little, we don't know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's super important. Uh, maybe Lars, help us, you know, give us an example of like how the equipment situation could get out of whack. Yeah, I mean, uh, let, let's let's take the example I mentioned earlier with the, the lack of vessels arriving in a timely fashion out in Asia here in mid-January. Those vessels, were, they are also the ones that are bringing a lot of the empty containers that we need for peak season in Chinese New Year. They will still get out there, but with the, all the schedules in disarray, they might actually not go to the ports that were originally planned. So you can easily end in a situation where, seen as a region overall, yeah, we have enough containers, but they might not be in the right geographical locations. And I think uh, here in Europe, for example, the big, we're talking a lot about imports from Asia at the moment, uh, but there's also an export market, right? And I'm curious to see how carriers will prioritize the containers, whether they will prioritize shipping them back to Asia to get the higher rate levels or shipping them to other regions uh, in the world. Uh, so, for example, from Europe to North America, where will the equipment be prioritized in, in this scenario? Maybe just to add a comment there, looking back at the pandemic history, the answer should be fairly straightforward. If there is a pressure, then carriers will not load empty containers, no matter what. Yeah. So uh, that would be good news for customers, right, if uh, if that happens again. Well, depending on where you need your cargo to go from, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Export customers. Um, and then, of course, the timelines that we're looking at, uh, you know, potentially in two weeks, there can be a solution. And then this will be a relative uh, non-event. 
uh, but this could also be a, a more structural thing that we will have to uh, to look at uh, over the next period of time. Uh, so, so that is known. And then I think, and I know we have the next slide specifically on this, but what is the, the plan in terms of security and some of the multinational uh, uh, actions that are being taken at the moment uh, to, uh, to secure the safe passage uh, through the Suez? Yeah, this is this is super important. So let's uh, let's unpack this for a moment. Uh, essentially, what the military um, coalition have been been out uh, announcing and, and that could uh, that, what that could mean. So essentially, um, Pentagon was out announcing you know a mission to essentially counterattack um, this situation. But what does it mean in terms of timing, uh, Lars? Uh, how long will 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 a coalition like this you know typically uh, take to essentially get up? And running and, 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 and implement that could be measured in weeks uh, that there are several things that need to come together not only do you need to have the right vessels in the region you have plenty of naval vessels in the region but they need to be equipped with the right missile technology to counter those missiles that are being sent out and the drones that that's one thing that needs to be in place the next thing even if you then have that coalition in place that doesn't change the fact that you are still at risk with your merchant vessels of being hit by a coming missile. Uh, let, let, let's put this in context. A decade ago, we had all the piracy activity off of Somalia. You also had naval vessels there. You were sailing in convoys being protected. But that threat is very, very different. The threat there was you would be boarded by skiffs with pirates. Having a naval presence could eliminate that threat. But having a naval ship there will not remove the threat that somebody's going to shoot a missile at you. I mean, you had the, the USS Kearney, they shut down 14 drones out of 14 here on Saturday, for example. Good for them, but no uh, missile technology is 100% foolproof. So are you going to risk life and limb of your seafarers and a billion dollars worth of cargo on board the ship in the hope that they will shoot down all of those missiles? What I think we are faced with here is something that might take more than just a couple of weeks. I mean, you might get the task force together down there, and that will likely mean that the vessel, I mean, let's be honest here, there are still ships that go through that strait. Some of them are very small container ships, but you have quite a number of multipurpose vessels, bulkers and some tankers, all small vessels. They're right now running the gauntlet. They're taking the chance. They will be better protected. But unless there is also a solution whereby the attacks themselves from land stop, or at least are eliminated drastically, I have a hard time seeing the carriers resume using uh, supersized post Panamax vessels through that region. And this is going to take time because the coalition we're hearing about here, that's about putting naval uh, vessels in the water, but there's absolutely no mentioning about how do they plan to reduce the risk coming from land. Super in insightful, Lars. I think also just if we look at the, the pure facts, right, in terms of, you know, when the, the carriers would expect this to, to potentially resolve. I think we're definitely, you know, close two weeks uh, out, right? Because we can already see by now, you know, literally on the map that, you know, carriers that had vessels in the Red Sea going to Mediterranean have already decided to reroute it south of the Cape, meaning that's, you know, at a minimum, you know, another two weeks of transit time. If they thought that this would be resolved within the next few weeks, they would have been better off uh, waiting and then essentially uh, go clear through the Suez Canal. Is that also how you see it, Lars? Or that's how I see it, and I and actually, yes, I see it. You can say the opposite way around. I saw all those vessels that were almost trapped in a bottle in the Red Sea. They couldn't go south; they would be shot at. And going north, that means paying a million dollars to go through the Suez Canal and then go all the way around Africa, which took you a couple of weeks. Which means that the carriers, for them to do that, they have an expectation this is likely going to take more than two weeks before we are willing to sail through this strait of water again. Thanks, Lars. Very, very clear. Okay, let's um, let's take a look at the big picture. Um, so right here, um, we've showed the, 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 the supply and demand balance in terms of you know container freight uh, over the years. If we zoom back at the uh, the ever given event uh, back in 2021, um, just for comparison, because that was essentially the ever given vessel being stuck in the in the Suez Canal for almost a week, which very much disrupted uh, the, 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 the freight uh, picture in, in, in that area. I think what's very important to keep in mind is that that came on top of a very, very tight supply and demand balance, uh, given the COVID economy 
you know, demand uh, skyrocketed. Um, now we have uh, still more capacity in, in the system and we have seen a wider gap uh, in terms of supply and demand uh, the past month and, and year. So it is a very, very different situation. And for the very same reason, we don't expect rates to, or at least personally, I don't expect rates to skyrocket to $20,000 per container, similar to what we saw with the uh, ever given situation in some weeks and some months, because uh, it came on top of a very, very tight supply demand balance. Having said that, we do expect, or personally at least, I do expect, you know, rates to increase significantly on some lanes, you know, potentially 3x, <clears throat> because this is coinciding with the Lunar New Year peak. Uh, but maybe... Back to you, uh, Lars, first and foremost. Do you agree with sort of the the, the essential prediction I just had right there? Or do you see it different? Do you think that, you know, rates could skyrocket to uh, $20,000 per container? No, I, I don't see rates come anywhere near those uh, astronomical levels that we saw during the, the pandemic disruptions. Absolutely not. And also for context, whenever given happened, rates were at levels that were 4 or 5x where we are now. Will we see rates increase uh, significantly, yes, but for two reasons. One reason is, of course, the disruption we have now. It is much more costly to go around Africa. But let's also not forget another thing. The carriers, barring this event, the carriers were all going to be loss-making here in Q4. The carriers had already announced rate increases for January because the current rate levels were unsustainable. So when we look at the potential rate increases, and some of them have been announcing FAK rates that seem to indicate potentially a tripling uh, on some trade rates, that is a combination of the effect uh, of, of the closure of the Suez Canal and of the effect that rate levels had in some cases actually reached unsustainably low volumes. So those two effects have to be seen uh, together. Not that I have the numbers immediately in mind, but maybe another way to think of it is not whether rates now will go up 3x. It will be how much will rates be higher than where they were, say, maybe 6, 8, 10, 12 months ago when they were still at levels where the carriers were at break even. At break even. That, that, that's that context to take into account as well. What are you seeing, particularly in, 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 in Europe, Trina? Um, last mentioned the general rate increases. Uh, you spoke briefly yourself to all the surcharges we're seeing, and, and, and there's more to it than just looking at the port to port rate, right? Especially some of these new uh, surcharges that we're seeing, right? I think we see some examples where surcharges are as high as $1,500 per container uh, from, um, from, from, from India to Europe. So yeah, help us understand a little bit sort of what you're seeing and, and what you predict here, Trina. Yeah, so, so we're seeing a few different uh, trends. You can say the floating market is obviously where you can shift things uh, around immediately. And we're seeing a, a big push in terms of rate increases here, uh, especially for uh, beginning of January, but I would say even more for the uh, last two weeks of January. Um, probably anticipating this uh, lack of equipment uh, at that time and potentially capacity issues. Um, so we're seeing it being communicated from carriers in various different ways. Uh, and at the moment, we're getting even this is the rate, but it's to PSS at the time. Uh, so it's also very obvious that uh, that all the carriers are trying to to navigate how to get the rate at uh, the right rate level to optimize uh, their bottom line uh, in January or up until Lunar uh, New Year. Um, then if for the fixed deals, we are seeing uh, a varying degree of uh, of actions. There's uh, of course peak season surcharges being uh, added. Uh, there's uh, contingency surcharges being added. So that is uh, the one you're referring to, Anna, so $1,500 per TU uh, out of India subcontinent into Europe. Um, so we're seeing a lot of different uh, ranges uh, and approaches depending on who, uh, who the carrier is. But overall, we are seeing the market move towards the, the tripling of, uh, of what we've seen early December. And just to be mindful, right, we have had in on Far East westbound, so Asia into Europe, there has been pushes for rate increases 1st of November, 1st of December, 15th of December, and there was already a rate increase announced for 1st of January. So it's pretty obvious that the carriers have been trying to push the rate levels very aggressively. Now, they, you know, with the current situation, they are 
you know, pushing it very hard uh, through. So that is sort of the situation that we're seeing right now. I, I think one more element we haven't touched upon, but that also has an impact, especially feeding into the rate levels going uh, into Europe, is the fact that here in 11 days, we're going to see carbon taxation on shipping coming into Europe, the EU ETS. And looking at the normal schedules, quite a few would have a stopover, for example, in Jeddah, which means that from January 1st, they had to pay carbon tax on emissions for the vessel going from, say, Jeddah to Rotterdam. Now they would have to pay tax on emissions from Singapore all the way around Africa, all the way up to Rotterdam. This is a massive increase in the carbon taxation the carriers are going to have to pay for this detour. Yeah. And that's a good point because we only got the last announcements around those around 1st of December. Um, and to be very transparent, there's uh, a bit of uh, chaos, uh, if we can refer to it uh, on that topic as well. Very uh, varying uh, amounts uh, depending on the carriers, uh, also whether UK uh, is, uh, is subject to or not. Um, so we you know, for now have said that we'll probably see regular updates on, uh, on the on the ETS uh, topic. Um, and you're right, Lars, this of course uh, will add uh, additional complexity on that topic. And if I may just come with a completely different comment, because we haven't discussed it, we actually haven't seen it discussed anywhere at all over all the debacle the last six days. You only have to go back a week and a half. We had the COP28 meeting in Dubai all of the shipping lines pledged that they were going to reduce carbon emissions. If there's one thing that's for sure, this debacle is going to dramatically increase the carbon footprint of all the carriers and therefore all the shippers. Definitely. Yeah. Not a great situation. Also incentivizing them to slow down the vessels where possible, right? Yeah. Which could have an even further impact on lead time. So yes. it's a big puzzle. Definitely. So Nathan, What's your view on uh, on prices coming into uh, North America? Uh, how does that compare to what Trina laid out here for Europe? Yeah, it actually compares very well. We've seen uh, the same uh, rate pressures in in North America. We saw uh, GRI land for the second half of December. was already announced for first half January. Um, we're starting to see even on fixed accounts, uh, peak season surcharges get announced for the second half of January. One thing about the United States uh, is the Federal American Time Commission rules around when rates can be announced. So uh, they have to have a 30 day lead time. So you're probably also going to sit, start seeing some strange validities. Um, you know, if they announce today, you might see a validity of the 20th of January for certain rates. So for shippers coming into North America, when your cargo sales matters, um, that's when your rate locks in. So um, keeping an eye on, on what services and when the validities are for, for when your rates are increasing is going to become really important. But we're definitely seeing the same thing. Also, if you look at the graph, I mean, the expected demand curve has been relatively flat this year. So there is still demand in the market as carriers uh, have been, you know, kind of uh, uh, adjusting their capacity to meet that demand and trying to find that right level where they can bring their their uh, charges to above their operating costs. And, and for most of the time on the Trans-Pacific, at least, we've seen carriers um, selling below their operating costs. So, and, and as a business, that's that's not a great model. Um, so uh, they've already been trying to, to kind of work their costs back in. And this is a, a, another reason. And, and, and obviously they're incurring real costs. We talked about that, you know, they're, they're going a longer distance. And while they're not paying the toll, um, to go through the Suez. They are paying more in fuel. They're paying more in environmental surcharges. They're paying more if they're doing carbon offsets. A lot of carriers do voluntary carbon offsets. That's going to cost them more because uh, they're, they're using more ton miles of, of bunker fuel. Uh, so all those things add in. And also if the carriers do decide to add extra vessels to, to make up slots and, and ad hoc sailings, that's another real cost. That's another vessel, another crew, uh, and more fuel for what is essentially the same amount of uh, containers per week moving. Um, all of that's going to get priced into the market. Um, all of that's going to also depend at the end of the day on demand. How does the market then respond to this pricing? But uh, I would agree with with everything that we're going to see rates come up pretty uh, substantially in January and, and probably remain at that level and it, for the foreseeable future until the situation is resolved. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, the price points are going to be a function of the supply and demand at each of the trade lane levels, right, week for week. 
Um, okay, let's pivot uh, in terms of what uh, what you can do out there if you are importing goods uh, to any of these uh, geographies. How to navigate these uh, these choppy waters, uh, Trina? So we've touched upon uh, many of the slides. So uh, so a quick summary in terms of what uh, what our recommendations are in the current environment. So first of all, incorporate the lead time into your inventory planning. Uh, there's the short-term uh, operational challenge uh, to make sure you deal with that, but also the longer term, uh, make sure that you have the additional transit time or lead time incorporated. Um, right now, it's a good idea to book uh, early. Uh, many prioritize on first come, first serve, uh, and uh, the earlier you book uh, can help you uh, secure the space and the equipment. Um, and also, as we mentioned, if you can potentially avoid the last two, of Jan uh, two weeks of January, that might be to your advantage. Um, that's, of course, not necessarily six weeks uh, booking prior, but uh, try to be mindful of, uh, of how you book your shipments. Also, if you can come after Lunar New Year, look at all your shipments uh, and then uh, uh, book as early as possible. Uh, plan for an increase in your transportation cost. Um, there's, of course, the increases in prices, but in case you need to expedite some of your cargo, uh, also make sure that you have uh, have plans uh, for that in there. Uh, make sure that you know where your cargo is at all times so that the planning, you know, on a daily basis also works so that your warehouse is prepared. You have the trucker you need to pick up the cargo uh, and, and so forth. Um, and then, uh, as we've mentioned here, there are alternative routings. Uh, there's also alternative modes. Uh, air uh, is, of course, the most obvious one, uh, but there's also options for sea air combinations. Um, and there are expedited ocean services uh, as well uh, that can help you balance that uh, lead time uh, need with, uh, with cost, uh, depending on, uh, on how critical the, the timing is. So these are the five recommendations that we are giving at the moment. Thanks, Trina. Yeah. So if, if I can just add, add, add one comment on the alternate down there, because as some might have seen, there are, and I think I mentioned it earlier, there are some small niche carriers that still do sail through the waters, which means shippers may come across the option of being offered, we can actually sail you Asia to Mediterranean through the Suez Canal, no problem. That is an alternate option. Shippers just need to realize that this comes at a risk. It definitely comes at a risk. You do risk losing your cargo, but I would also read insurance premiums extremely carefully to see if you are covered in a situation where the risk is this obvious. And I would not be surprised if some might find it impossible to get their cargo insured at all. Yeah, that's a very good point, Lars. Talking about premium services, what, what does that actually mean, right? There's more to it than you just, you know, paying a premium price to get your cargo loaded. We've actually seen um, a whole lot of new point-to-point -point, uh, services being launched uh, the past uh, many months, which uh, come in handy in this situation. So, Nathan, uh, let's take a look at what that looks like on the Trans-Pacific. Yeah, on the, on the Trans-Pacific, these services are, are existing services that move out of uh, Shanghai, Ningbo, and Yantian. Uh, we actually saw Zim come back into this market with the ZEX, uh, was reannounced in November and started sailing in December. Uh, so what these are, um, when you're talking premium, these are dedicated vessels uh, going on dedicated services between dedicated terminals. Uh, and then uh, they come with protection for roll. So they are no roll protected uh, at origin. They come with equipment guarantees. So you will uh, be able to pull equipment uh, without issue. Once it's loaded on the vessel and, and comes across, it does fast steam across. So you see really great transit times here, uh, 11 to 12 days from Ningbo in Shanghai, uh, 13 days to 12 to 13 days from Yantan into LA Long Beach. They get priority birthing windows, priority discharge, uh, and priority availability. So you know, normally coming into LA Long Beach, a container is available within about three to four days of vessel arrival, depending on the discharge schedule. Uh, these services uh, generally make your container available within 12 to 24 hours. So, and these are on chassis, ready to go for the trucker to come in, pick them up and, and begin delivery. Uh, they all then come with these rail connections and you can see those there. Those are your typical destinations. 
Uh, and this is slightly different rail than what you would see with normal international rail in the United States. So when you see a container on a train, that is generally considered international rail. Uh, these are moving on fast rail services. So uh, dedicated daily trains into places that, that are generally moving things like uh, you can think UPS, FedEx, US Mail. When you see the Amazon containers, if you've ever seen those moving, these are special through trains uh, and not your typical uh, container services. So. Uh, really good end to end. So when we're talking premium services, that's what it's really about is it's premium from end to end. It isn't just a loading priority. It isn't just a slightly faster vessel. It is, it is a white glove service from end to end, highly reliable, but they they do come at a premium. These are, um, generally a, a couple thousand dollars more than the FAK rate. So, uh, good service. There are connections also from South, uh, South Asia. So there are connections to these services from, uh, Vietnam, um, from Malaysia, uh, places like that. So you can connect into these services as well. And they do offer a, a great alternative uh, for, for clients who are trying to get to the East Coast. Thanks, Nathan. A great, great alternative to some of the previous transit times you showed into the East Coast, right? In some cases, you know, half, half the transit time end to end. Yes. But to your point, it also comes at a premium price, uh, you know, to the tune of a, a few thousand dollars. Again, all depending on the situation, right? There will probably be more demand for these uh, going going forward, given what we're seeing right here, right now. Thanks, Nathan. Super helpful. Um, what else um, to, to do out there? How to navigate the, the situation if you're an importer, if you're a shipper out there, Lars? What to do? From from a pure perspective of getting the best possible information, there's only one of these four that's going to work. And that's talking to your logistics partner, whoever that logistics partner is. Going to carry advisories, we've seen over the last six days that carriers have been enormously slow in advising anybody in terms of what they're actually going to do. Government advisories are even slower and much too high level to be used for any useful purpose for, for logistics out there. And with the AIS tracking where the ships are, sure, you can see where is the ship. But that's not going to tell you anything about what is that ship actually going to do and when is it going to do it. So in this particular situation, there, there really is no good alternative than to stay really on top and breathing down the neck of whichever logistics partner it is you're using. In talking about what a logistics partner can do right here, uh, just to round us off, Trina, um, so what, what are you and the teams doing in particular, you know, on, on the Europe shipments with the with all of your clients, uh, can, can you talk a little bit about, about that? Yeah, so uh, I think uh, first off, uh, a kudos to uh, the tech teams here because uh, over the past couple of days and night, they have uh, been repurposing some existing functionality to allow all of our customers themselves to go in and see any vessel that is diverted uh, or paused. Um, so on this uh, map here, any vessel that is orange, it's a diverted vessel, but on top of that, they can also see their own shipments. So, of course, that helps our customers to to stay more in control. We are constantly trying to update the transit times uh, to make it as transparent as possible. But, of course, also our operational teams are using this to make sure that we can inform very much in line to what you say, Lars, right? Inform customers about what is the situation on, on each and every single individual shipment. Um, so... Uh, encouragement here just uh, to make sure that uh, that you ask your logistics partners if it's you know not us and if we're not doing it tell us but uh, but always ask her to uh, to keep you informed uh, and updated and uh, to all of the existing customers uh, on the website here just wanted to highlight so that you know it's available that it's available for you uh, on the platform Great. Thanks, Trina. And then I think also just a general advice for me, I would encourage you all to follow Lars on LinkedIn if you, if you don't already do it. There are a lot of uh, good instant updates at the daily level that uh, that are particularly useful for me. Um, so uh, other than that, I mean, if you have any follow-up questions to what uh, you heard uh, here in this webinar, feel free to ping either of us directly, uh, reach out to uh, to anyone at Flexport. Uh, we're all here to help you. It's a very fluid situation, changing by the day i know it's overwhelming uh but uh yeah it's just a matter of like navigating the situation as best possible uh so with uh, those words uh, let's wrap it up and uh, have a great day thanks everyone thanks everyone